I just want to introduce myself. I'm Jane Burton from the Tate, and the Tate is a family of four galleries in the UK. We have Tate Modern, which is a collection of international and contemporary art, and we have about five million visitors a year to Tate Modern. That's probably the most famous of the Tates. We also have Tate Britain, which houses, also in London, houses the collection of historic British art and contemporary British art. And then we have Tate Liverpool in the north of the country and Tate St Ives in the south. And the galleries share their collection of international modern and contemporary art and the national collection of British art from 1500 to today. And the galleries are free to general access to the collection and we have paying exhibitions. Okay, great. Lee. So thank you, Nancy and Rich, for inviting me here. I was invited here to talk about apps and mobile apps that uh, deal with the notion of play, gaming. But before I get into the three apps that I'm going to present as case studies, I just wanted to make a plea for mobile video as being a really cheap, cost-effective way of engaging audiences who might not generally come to an art museum like ours. Um, the audience for mobile video in particular is growing exponentially, and I really think it can be quite successful. So I'm going to show you a clip of a film um, that we made to try to help people understand what Tate Britain represents. We have no trouble getting young people and huge audiences to Tate Modern, but Tate Britain has a slightly stuffy reputation. People think it's just the old stuff. They don't understand that we have contemporary art there too, and in fact it is a very wonderful place to visit. So we invited a comedian called Adam Buxton, a British comedian, to come and tour the museum in his own words. I apologise if this slightly uh, is, is very British humour. It may translate, it may not, but see what you think. Here we go. was seen by about 50,000 people and, and continues to generate an audience. It's one of a whole series we made where we brought in different celebrities, musicians and commentators to give a kind of alternative perspective on uh, the collection at Tate Britain. But now to what I'm supposed to be talking about, which is mobile apps. Um, just to set the scene, Tate for a long time has had mobile tours of its exhibitions using generally um, iOS devices and uh, bespoke um, devices which we work with a company called Antenna Audio to deliver. 
Here's one for our Gauguin show. We also often create uh, app versions so that you can download and uh, bring, your, bring it on your own device should you wish to for our main exhibitions. But we also wanted to look at um, the playful space, if you like, playful apps. What would happen if we tried to use the App Store to create some kind of game? And of course, there are hundreds of thousands of apps for smartphone consumers to choose from, but most of them are games. They make up 70 to 80% of all the apps downloaded. And we thought uh, we should test this market and see what happened. So the first that we launched, the first of three, was called Tate Trumps. And it essentially is a card game in which you select works of art to form your hand of cards, and then you pit them against your opponent. Uh, in battle mode, you need to ask the question, if this artwork came to life, how would it do in a fight? In mood mode, you're looking for artworks you think are menacing, exhilarating, or absurd. Or you can play at being a collector and choose works that you think would look good in your house, uh, are famous or recently crea created. And once you've made a selection, you either play against your friends, so it can be a social game, or against a computer to see who did the best if you're on your own. This is the battle mode, mood mode, collector mode options. Some players, so oh, the Rodan's The Kiss was doing quite well on exhilaration, but frankly wasn't very menacing and only faintly absurd. We pre-scored everything, so you were kind of second guessing what our curatorial teams had uh, awarded to each artwork in the collection. Here's a very short clip to demonstrate. Have you ever strolled through Tate Modern, wondering about what would happen if the works of art came to life and, you know, had a bloody fight to the death? Well, that's what we're going to do. Yeah. Well, I So for the next game, we wanted to make something um, that would work beyond the galleries. We got, Tate Tramps was popular in the galleries, but we got quite a lot of complaints from the online audience who said, we can't play it, what's the point? It's an app and we can only play it if we come to Tate Modern. So we had to do a second version to uh, allow them to have an out of gallery experience. The second game, we just said, let's just think about um, the online audience. We'll add a, a, a bonus for those who come to the gallery, but we're just gonna go with the flow and make a game that's all about gaming. <laughs> So it's called Race Against Time. The user plays a chameleon who's traveling through the history of modern art to try to defeat the evil Dr. Grayscale who's sucking color from the world. And as the game erases through 100 years of modern art, they see caricatures of uh, art movements and um, art opponents, and they learn tiny little facts as they are either decimated by Picasso or they leap over Kurt Schwitters or whatever it is. It was quite hard to integrate some form of information and content without getting in the way of the gameplay. And I think that's the biggest lesson we learned is don't put too much in there. And in the end, we, we had a very light um, information giving mode, if you like, as you played the game. And only when you completed a level did you then get an actual image of an artwork and some genuinely sort of curatorial information. There's our chameleon. Again, a short clip. So one nice touch there was the music which we had composed uh, reflected the period through which you're moving. 
and also the power up, the idea that if you did come to the gallery at Tate Modern, um, the GPS uh, would know you were there and would give you an extra boost so that you could achieve the highest level. The final of the three games is uh, called Magic Tate Ball, and um, this one was our most successful. Don't know why. Um, what you do is you shake your phone. It works on Nokia platform or, or iOS Apple platform, and it will curate a piece of work specifically re relevant to your place, time, the weather, um, the ambient sound. So it's using the feeds on your smartphone to get some kind of data about you and where you are in your daily life. And then it draws something from Tate's collection and serves it to you with a kind of witty factoid about, uh, Twitter size sort of factoid about that work. Here we go, a clip of that. So that one um, has had over 100,000 downloads worldwide and um, really, I think, captured the public imagi imagination. One thing we hadn't quite factored in is how popular it would be in other countries beyond the UK. And a lot of the information within the game is about GPS location. So a lot of our artwork by its nature is relevant, particularly to the UK. So how well it functions here in Hong Kong, I'd be intrigued to know. Certainly some of the functionality would be fine, the date the time, the weather, the ambient noise, but I suspect there's fewer of our works are geolocated relevantly to um, China. It also uh, taught me some lessons about what platform you put your game out on. Nokia, uh, the platform that we had, it's not the latest Nokia phones, but their Symbian versions did very well in India, for instance. So again, it begs the question, what does a museum mean to beyond your locality, if you like, and particularly, how do we think about the digital, digital space to take what we offer in our museums to very broad global worlds who may have different languages, different cultural backgrounds, but clearly, certainly with the example of Magic Tape Ball, are finding something of relevance and interest, uh, and we can mean something to them. We need to know much more about how our products are being consumed and what we can offer to this global audience through uh, apps and online in the future. And I think it's very early days. It's the beginning of a whole different way in which museums can position themselves beyond their physical spaces and beyond their locality. So just a few overarching thoughts to finish. Having shown you some apps, I would say, do you really need an app? <laughs> um, I think HTML5 programming offers some amazing opportunities for online projects that can capture almost all the things you would want to do uh, that previously could, could only be done with an app. Not quite all, but a lot of them. And in fact, one of the most successful games that I know of is uh, Launch Ball from the Science Museum, which was done way back in 2007. It wasn't an app. It's played in kiosks, in gallery, and online. It's for the Science Museum in London. And it was designed for children aged between 8 and 14. And they've had over 5 million players on that game. I think those numbers and that demographic, children, would be very hard to reach in the app store. Because although uh, we might not realize it, most apps are consumed not by children, but by people, certainly games, people over the age of 30. And 68% uh, of the gamers are um, 18 years or older. 47% of all players are women. And women over 18 years of age are one of the industry's fastest, fastest growing demographics. So if you're making a game, Think about who is playing it, and that will help determine what platform you put it on. In the App Store, it's probably a 30-something woman, which may not be what we initially imagine. And then make it free. There's hundreds of thousands of apps available. It's a bit like throwing your money down a well. How is yours going to be discovered? One, make it free. Two, think about a marketing campaign to support it. We certainly did that for the last app we made, Magic Tape Ball, which did help. And 
increasingly, to me, it looks interesting to think about uh, app stores, if you want to make an app, that are, are not the iOS platform. So what's happening with Android, Nokia stores, which are a little less crowded and which may actually suit um, different countries better. I was really interested to see, looking at some statistics before I came, <coughs> these latest statistics from Flurry that show countries with the greatest number of active iOS and Android devices, showing US is huge, but China is enormous as well, which I hadn't realized. So clearly there is a market here for content served on those platforms. What, what uh, other platforms are offering, I don't know. It'd be really interesting to find out and tailor your product to where the people are and what they're using. Thank you very much. <laughs>